Okay, so aside from the kind of the, you know, the requirements and characteristics of connected devices, specifically we're going to talk about uh, YSOCs. Uh, what is a YSOC? What does a YSOC do? What you know, components does it have? And we'll uh, give a quick example of one such device utilizing these wireless SOCs. Um, and after a little bit of introduction to hardware, uh, again, Ivan is, is going to talk about uh, the OpenWRT. Um, but it's, it's a fairly complex process, and it's a fairly complex project, and we only have 15, 20 minutes. So there's a lot of text on the slides. It's meant to be a reference thing you can get back to, or later in the pub we can talk more about the individual details that you might be interested in. So again, this is what I was trying to talk about earlier. Um, you could look at the connected device ecosystem in three aspects. You have things. Again, these could be small microcontrollers, you know, Linux class devices. Um, and gateways are generally, again, Linux class devices. So the YSOCs, or the YSOC devices I'm going to talk about today, are mainly used in these two first two categories. And services, it's fluffy clouds. So we're not that interested in that at the moment. So a YSOC is a wireless system on chip device. Generally, um, it's just like a normal system on chip device with some sort of wireless capability bolted onto it. And the specific class of devices that we're going to talk about today are the Wi-Fi 802.11 class uh, radios integrated with MIPS or small ARM cores. Um, MIPS is not dead. MIPS is very much alive, especially in this category of devices. Um, these devices generally have external RAM, external you know, SPI flash or some kind of storage device that you can bolt on. They're not like microcontrollers. They can run Linux fairly comfortably, uh, just mainline Linux. They don't have to go through any special patches or anything. And the kind of companies that produce these chips are big semiconductor companies. Uh, the likes of Qualcomm, Atheros, MediaTek, Rallink. Um, you know, there are quite a lot of different chips that they produce, but if you look at all of them, they, they pretty much are the same thing. So, uh, and also, like, connected devices, IoT, et cetera, they, they kind of, their marketing folks have re realized this, and they, they market these chips for Internet of Thing applications. They don't specify which thing it is, but at least they have it in their data sheets now, so we're all good. Um, so a generic architecture for one of these devices looks a bit like this. Um, I, small diagrams. Big room, sorry about that. Uh, but generally, it's a processor core. Um, it's a MIPS core, <laughs> generally. And a whole bunch of interfaces, everything from SPI to PCI Express, right? So um, this is not Arduino. This is not like you know your microcontroller class devices. You can bolt on anything to these. Um, and you'll also notice, I don't know if it's visible, but you'll also notice that there's a, there's a Wi-Fi, kind of like a WLAN ch chip or component bolted onto the peripheral bus on this. So really, with just, just this chip and a couple of support components, uh, you have an embedded Linux system. And this is generally what you will find inside your home router or home gateway or you know, those kind of devices. Um, again, interfaces, SPI, I2C, I2S, PWM, PCI Express, USB, like big boy interfaces alongside the true embedded, true embedded interfaces. Um, so one example device is this little guy here. That's the well, it's this guy. Um, this is like wildly popular, and people have been using this for their own projects. And realistically, if you're only producing, say, a hundred of something, it really doesn't make sense to go for a full custom, you know, um, YSO class board, because these things are expensive in small volumes, and manufacturing is a bit difficult. I'll touch on that in a bit as well. Um, so this guy is. You can be, buy this for around 15 pounds. It's very cheap. Um, and it's based on the Qualcomm Atheros AR9331. Actually, this chip is sold. It was just Atheros back then, but Qualcomm then bought Atheros. Um, if you look at the components uh, inside this, uh, it's the YSOC itself, the AR9331, just here. Um, on top, there you, ha you can see the RAM. Um, it's an external DDR memory. And the other red rectangle over there is the SPI flash. So really, you have three main chips. Uh, and some YSOCs even come with embedded um, storage uh, and embedded RAM as well. But you're probably much better off just adding external components because the kind of on-die or on-package um, sorry, RAM and storage are generally fairly small. Um, and aside from that, it's just the usual like Ethernet jack, USB, power circuitry, and all that stuff. So these devices are designed to be integrated in very high volume applications with very low bomb costs. Um, 
Now, unfortunately, um, this is not like the Atmega 328. You can't just by go to RS. Um, Peter's here. So if you, can, you can't just go to RS and buy a single quantity of these things. You can source these from questionable supplies. So I, I got this from a market vendor in Shenzhen, or you can go to AliExpress and order these things. But the problem is these are, it's a dual row QFN with 140 or somewhat odd pins. So you can't really do much with them. And even though you're really good at soldering or you had the setup to manufacture boards with this, um, they, had, like, they require a certain uh, specific manufacturing step, which is called the factory and calibration. Um, process and that requires some very expensive you know hardware and a whole bunch of stuff that I can't talk about um, so really for like producing boards at home or small quantities these are terrible to work with but at the same time if you're doing any commercial projects with these they're great because again the bomb cost is very low and these are very capable devices so there is a solution to this though. So if you're manufacturing, say, a couple of thousand of these things, it's very easy. You go find a factory that is geared up to do the factory calibration, etc., and they can just churn out boards. And this is very easy. But if you're manufacturing very small to kind of medium scale, um, you go with these modules, or actually on the top right corner, that's insides of the TP-Link uh, thing here. So there are a whole bunch of companies that will sell you the YSOC itself with some external um, SPI flash and RAM. And they, when you buy these, they will ha already have gone through the factory and calibration process. And you can just integrate these into your products. Um, and also, some of these companies are actually now realizing the potential for you know, doing me mid medium scale runs for companies who are not set up to you know, manufacture with these kind of devices as well. So you could go with the module-based approach. Um, and these modules are very cheap, by the way. Uh, you can develop your prototype. And even you know, small quantity manufacturing uh, can be based on these. And then once you reach a certain scale, it might make sense to go and talk to these companies and say, hey, can you produce a couple hundred for me? And then once you reach thousands, you can just go and find a factory that will do this for you. Um, and that's the hardware part of the talk. We're now going to talk a bit about, or rather, Ivan is going to talk a bit about the OpenWRT side of things. Um, and yeah, so let's switch over. Okay, so my name is Ivan, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, OpenWRT, and specifically I'm going to focus on uh, which benefits, um, some of the advantages that um, using OpenWRT can bring to developing your new IoT products. Um, uh, first question is, um, how many of you have uh, used the OpenWRT before? Okay. Right, so what is OpenMRT is an embedded list uh, Linux uh, distribution that you can, uh, uh, that you can uh, customize uh, through OpenMRT developer env environment, which is a self-contained uh, environment that also includes cross-compilation uh, uh, toolchains, generates uh, cross-compilation toolchains, as well as uh, root file systems. It's available for uh, a lot of architectures and uh, it has a great support for a lot of uh, packages. So um, the good thing is that most of those uh, packages uh, came with, um, uh, with some patches. So some misbehaving pa uh, package has been patched for um, architectures they have problem with. So this is a great advantage uh, instead of using your, you know, try to take your desktop Linux distribution into one embedded systems. So can save you some hair in developing embedded systems, basically. This is the main uh, OpenWRT configuration interface, um, where you can select features. Uh, most of Linux hackers can recognize this interface, since uh, the OpenWRT menu config is based on the Linux uh, kernel key config. And you can select uh, functionalities um, in the target system. For instance, uh, um, here we select uh, the ARN331, which is the SOHC that 
for the TP Link board uh, on my laptop before. Yeah, this one. And uh, uh, we can also select the profile for specific for this board that uh, will pick up the right uh, device tree uh, yeah, and so on. So the software is uh, um, divided in uh, categories and you can easily include that um, just using your space. It will put a star like in the Linux kernel, exit and build and you will have a, a firmware image with uh, all the uh, custom software there. So um, you can also uh, compile your own software on uh, OpenWRT. It's um, quite uh, easy to do. Um, the, what you need to do basically is write an OpenWRT make file for the package you want to build. So this is an example for uh, an hello world. That basically this will override the um, uh, compilation uh, variables of your make file like CC and C flags and uh, we'll use the right uh, compiler. So there is also uh, a good um, support for uh, several interpreters uh, such as Erlang, Java, Lua, Node, PHP, Python, and, and so on. So one of the main issues when you develop an embedded Linux uh, uh, environment, uh, an embedded Linux product, is dealing with the configuration files. For instance, um, for the, the configuration files of uh, all the programs running on uh, uh, your distribution. For instance, if you want to configure uh, some functionality uh, at the runtime, let's say you have a web interface and you want to, to adapt uh, some configuration files based on the user input, input you need to basically parse uh, those files and in order to match the format. It's mm, quite a bit tricky. So uh, OpenRBRT solves this problem with, uh, in a very elegant way called UCI. UCI basically it's a unified uh, configuration uh, interface that uh, unifies all the files in a single folder. And all those configuration files will uh, uh, have the same syntax. And um, uh, so basically, um, you know, um, it will be easier to configure your software. Also, even if it was uh, mainly um, created for the OpenWRT uh, software, uh, there are now um, bindings for 30 part programs as well. So they have been made compatible with the UCI as well. So this is a, a, a syntax for um, UCI configuration files. And we can see an example here. This is a, a network configuration file where you basically have, you can configure the interface for instance, loopback. You can have the interface, you specify the interface, a protocol, IP address, netmask, same for LAN. You have yeah, uh, the internet interface and so on. This is another example. This is the system configuration files where you can specify stuff like open the, uh, the host name, the time zone, the list of NTP servers you want to use and choose if you want to enable that feature or not. So UCI, uh, even if you can configure the UCI configuration files using your own editor, uh, that is not uh, practical when you want to uh, do that through a script. So for this reason, there is a, a command line utility that allows you to to modify the entries in the configuration files, such as uh, even uh, revert if something uh, went wrong, and commit definitely when everything is okay in the hash. Thank you. So. Another issue uh, in, uh, develop, uh, in developing a meta Linux product is when you want to know the status of uh, general status of your system. If you want, for instance, to know which IP address your internet uh, interface has, or the uptime, or many other things, what you need to do basically is parsing the output of if config um, or think about you want to retrieve a list of wireless network uh, available. 
you need to parse like in, in wconfig, wpsci, in wpsli, um, that can be quite complicated uh, besides be error prone. So you must, um, it's basically a, dem a daemon where um, the daemon registers and they set their function, the the names, uh, their namespaces, and the and the functionalities, the the procedures that they they provides. Um, and this is the command line tool for Ubus. We will f see you probably list and uh, call with uh, list. You can list all the namespace registered inside Ubus. So, for instance, you can read your log. You can um, see. You can also configure UCI. And uh, in case you want to know more information about your LAN interface, you can list all the procedures available for that LAN interface. And you can bring that up, down, and you can even get the status. So the nice thing is that the communication happen in, um, in, in JSON format. So you, you get basically all those information in that format, which is much nicer to parse since it is also unified. So DBUBus is uh, the way to go if you want to, your custom so to register your custom software to the UBUS. And there are also bindings for Lua, and it is also possible to expose uh, a shell script functionalities in UBUS. And other examples can be found in uh, OpenWRT Wiki. Another important uh, uh, very nice feature is uh, the UBUS uh, plugin for H uh, UHTTPD, which is the OpenWRT web server. So basically, that plugin allows you to call a UBUS functionality um, over HTTP with just uh, with the JSON RPC specification. So you basically um, have um, do an authentication. You can use the the user um, in that uh, in your system in the of your Linux system. So you authenticate with the username password. You get a token. You use that token to uh, perform your operations in UBUS. So this can be really nice. For instance, let's say you want to reach and retrieve over uh, all the Wi-Fi networks available from your the access point you are developing or your new IoT product, right? And you get a list uh, already formatted in JSON without parsing anything or writing any CGI or PHP uh, backend, right? So. What um, when we got uh, uh, if you want to get started with OpenWRT, um, you can use the main tri uh, the trunk tree that is the development tree. Uh, so it might be unstable and use that only if you need some uh, functionalities that are not in the stable tree or uh, some SOC that is not in the stable uh, that uh, has been recently added and is not in the stable tree. And the stable tree right now is a cost calmer, and you can just scroll uh, the repo, read the readme, and you are ready to start. And that's it. Thank you.